when you're working remotely, there's a bunch of things that are going to be, you know, it's, there's just sort of getting in the way of you being as productive as possible, because here's the thing, right? Up until COVID, remote work was the anomaly. It wasn't the norm. Usually everybody's used, everybody here is probably used to going to big office buildings, working from there, being around people. And that just sort of, you know, puts you in a different sort of zone. That's how we're wired to think that as long as you're in an office, you're around colleagues who are working along the same thing, you're going to be more productive. But when you're working remotely, that's a huge challenge, right? As some of you already said it, that, you know, what distractions can be difficult, especially when you're working and distractions can get in the way of you being as productive as possible. So for this training session, what me and Jeff are going to talk about is, number one, how you can be as productive as possible. And number two, how you can pay more attention to detail while you're at work. What this does is sort of improve the quality of your work, right? Everybody can work. I know that all of you are hardworking people um, putting in the best you can, but how do you elevate that work? How do you make it even better? The answer is in front of you, attention to detail. Now, I'm, I went to Google and I looked up, what's the definition of attention to detail? How do I explain it to these people? And it turns out that the definition is really straightforward. Thoroughness and accomplishing a task through concern for all years, blah, blah, blah. I'm pretty sure half of you lost me through the half sentence, but it's, here's the keywords. Attention to detail is ensuring there's quality in your work by being extremely thorough and by being efficient. If you can make sure the small bits that nobody tends to care about, like, oh my God, does this sentence, should this email have perfect punctuation? Should this be grammatically perfect? Should I send it out right now when everybody is asleep or should I send it out in the morning so that it pings in the middle of the day? Things like these, that's attention to detail. Everybody here can work on a project and probably do a decent job. But you know, the difference between doing a decent job and doing an amazing, extraordinary job is attention to detail. Questions, any, no? Okay. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna comment there. So Go ahead. As you're working on a task, you want to be as efficient on a task as you can be. And so the more you learn your core skills of how to, you know, just be an administrative type person, how to be an associate that's a virtual assistant, so you're learning your tools, all of those kinds of things will make you more efficient. But the second part that's not talked about here is if you're working for a small company, and I think all of you are, then you have to take into account effectiveness. All right. So it's the comment I always make is everybody says, well, I'm working on the right thing. And that sounds good. You're working on the right thing. But is that enough? Is working on the right thing enough? Come on, somebody's got to chime in or we're going to sit here silently for the next half hour. Yep, and we don't want to be awkward here. So somebody needs to, this is, remember you guys, this is a conversation. I don't like to do training sessions where I'm this lecturer in a university. No, this is going to be an interactive session. So feel free to comment, ask questions, um, raise concerns. That's why we're here. So Jeff had a question. I'm going to randomly pick on people unless somebody speaks up in the next five seconds. Yeah, I don't think that's enough just to do the work. I mean, it has to be uh, based on the output that you're getting or what kind of results you're getting from putting in the work. Okay, but that's, uh, that's still doing the right thing, okay? I believe uh, uh, getting the concept of what you're working uh, and if that works is building your character as well and making it you uh, understand more of what you're doing, uh, that's what uh, the work should be doing. Uh, that's how the the work should give you the output. That's what I believe. Okay. This my question. My question really doesn't have to do with output. We're assuming that you're getting your work done. But what's more important than just getting the work done? I believe that what's more important is the whole process because getting the work done is one thing. You can get the work done at the office at home as well, but the whole process, how you basically get the work done and like already mentioned the attention to details, every little thing. So the whole process, if you're using the right process or not, I think that matters a lot as well. 
Okay, so I'm going to, you guys are talking around it, but this is a mantra that I have. It's not Do just it doing well. the right. It's just not just doing the right thing. It's doing it in the right order. Okay. Because, you know, if you just do what you believe is the right thing, you can work all day long. You can report into your client, your boss, whatever you want to say. And they're like, I didn't need you to work on that today. I need you to work on something else. And you're like, well, but yesterday at the end of the day, you told me to work on X, Y, Z, and I did that. And they forgot because you're virtual to adjust your workload for the day. So one of the biggest things you can do is communicate with your client every day. Again, it only needs to be a short question or just a straight out, you know, today I'm working on building the list you requested of, of names of businesses. Send that over Slack, Teams, you know, text. I don't care how you get it to them. And that gives them the opportunity to reconsider in that morning, are you working on the right thing in the right order? You ever notice that when you put a cart and a horse, you can go down the road riding in your little cart, right? The horse is pulling. Well, put the horse behind the cart. Now what are you doing? Now uh, you're the horse. Yeah, that's right. You're the horse, not only pulling the cart, but you're pulling the horse. So it's critical. I mean, I deal with this every day in my business, and I want all of you thinking about it. The right thing in the right order is the part that's called effectiveness. Okay. Efficiency is important in that task. That's what we're going to talk about attention to detail. But Sometimes you can do the very best on that task and then later find out that you were just working on the wrong thing. That you're communicating with your client. And remember, in small business, most of your business owners are working every day in crisis mode. And how are they deciding which crisis to work on? By the one that's causing the biggest fire. That's right. The one that's screaming the loudest, right? So even though last night when everybody went to bed and you were all in agreement, when he, and this is happening to me, to me this morning, I made a decision yesterday, learned something new this morning. And so already this morning in my company, I'm having to rethink my whole decision that I made yesterday because of, I have more detail today. So I'll be changing my mind. And if my team is still working on what I told them yesterday, yeah. they'll be working on the right thing, but it'll definitely be in the wrong order. So um, I'll send it back to Sabui to talk about attention to detail at work. So actually talking about what Jeff said about doing things in the right order, that's number two on my list over here. The first thing when it comes to improving efficiency and improving attention to detail when you're at work, thereby improving your productivity, is to plan. Anything you've got, any project, because when you're starting to work with your clients, you're going to get a million things that they're going to want you to do, and not necessarily in the right order. Right, they're gonna tell you, oh, this is supposed to be done. This is supposed to be done. This is supposed to be done. They're not gonna tell you when to do what all of the time. Sometimes, but not all the times. But while when you start working with them, you will start to get a hang of what's important right in that moment, what's urgent, what's less urgent, and then what's not very, very urgent. So the thing that's super important is to triage. Look at the list of things you have to do and triage what needs to be done now, what needs to be done yesterday, and what needs to be done maybe tomorrow or day after tomorrow. Once you are done, you've done that, now you have a list of tasks going down in urgency. And you can start with the one that is demanding the most of your attention, that's causing the biggest fire, right? Once you have that in place, the second step is to create a schedule. Why do you guys think it's important to create a schedule, even though your boss or client hasn't really assigned you one? Because I think it's really important that you prioritize everything, because if there is no prioritization of which tasks need urgent attention, then it will all do go down the road. Even though you will be working on a lot of things, if there is no set 
timings you know assigned to it you won't be able to do things in the right way also and also according to client's requirements so i think that's I, why scheduling and hence prioritization is important i believe uh, time management uh, creating a schedule will help you uh, manage your time and uh, so that you can according to your prioritization you can manage time awesome who else does anyone else want to chime in uh i think uh, time management and creating a schedule will uh, put us in the right direction uh, it will help us out it will help us figure out which task needs how much of our time and uh, how much of a concentration Awesome. So let's say that you've triaged, you've put down your task in terms of urgency, you've decided what to do when, you've given yourself a deadline. What's the next step? What do you do now before you start working? Good morning, on Jeff. This is River Kale. With Anyone? What's the next step? What do you do after you're done triaging and creating a schedule? It's just before you start working. There's one really small step, and it's crucial if you want to be successful in what you're doing. Uh, revising it. Um, you should try uh, it breaking time. breaking down your minutes. schedule, breaking down the tasks. To okay. If something tasks. has to see something has slipped out of the mind uh, when making a to-do list. We will get that. We will get to the to-do list in a bit, but. Once, let's assume you've done that. You've put everything down to the dot. You've got all your tasks there, ready to start, ready to work on. There's one thing you need to do. What is that? Especially when you're working with your clients. I and Jeff talked about it just a few minutes ago. Right, um, prioritization of tasks. Get their approval. Uh, uh, Recheck for the follow-up. Follow 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 okay, let's do it one follow at a time. Okay. Reconsidering somebody the order of the task. About, somebody said something about communication who was that yeah, speaking okay. with the client you need to get yes. your client's approval yeah, yeah keeping them in the loop exactly it's very simple a lot of people don't think about it but guess what it can make the difference between your triaging being successful and your list and your schedule working and not like jeff said if you're doing things in the wrong order it doesn't it really doesn't matter. All that work you're going to put in would be more effective if you actually have your client's approval for it, right? Now, let's say you think in your head because you're looking at it from your perspective. You're looking at it from your associate perspective. You've been given a bunch of tasks with a bunch of deadlines and now you're going to do it. But maybe your client thinks that, huh, this is not very, very important at the moment. This is a little more important. So every time you're done creating a schedule for the day, why do we ask you guys to share your agenda? Why do we, the purpose of checking in with your client at the start of the day isn't so that you're just marking your attendance. No, it's that you can start productively for your day. So you create a list of tasks you're going to complete and you're going to talk about what you're going to work on when. And you're going to send it over to your client that, hey, Mr. Client, this is what I'm planning on working on right now. And these are the tasks I'm going to complete by the end of the day. These are the things I'm going to work on tomorrow. Now, what you're doing is, number one, you're reassuring your client that you have a plan and you're working on the things they assigned you so that they don't have to you know, run after you, per se. Number two, you're proving to your client that you're proactive about these things. And number three, you're letting your client know what you're up to, therefore giving them the chance to tell you what to work on and what to leave aside for the time being. So maybe in your list, you've got two, three tasks that you feel like are really important and you've put them down for today. But guess what? Maybe your client's going to tell you, huh, these are things that can wait. That frees up more time on your day to do other things that are more important for your client. Cool. Cool. All right, moving on, have a step-by-step -step manual. Now, I don't mean that every day you guys go in and you start you know, creating this really long list with instructions underneath it, step one, step two, step three, no. But it's important that when you have a list in place, you know what you're gonna do with your time. Now, I have a story to tell, and this is gonna sound ridiculous because it's about my cook. And what really frustrates me is how badly she uses her time. For example, she's going to, let's say we've asked her to make pasta. She's going to put the pasta in the bowl to boil and she's going to sit and wait for it to boil. Once it's done, she's going to drain it, 
And then she's going to start cutting the vegetables or the cheese or the sauce or the meat that she's going to put in it. How can this be done better? Any, any guesses? Multitasking. Multitasking. Yes. Yep, exactly. Cut the vegetables when the pasta is boiling. Why sit and waste that time? That like same that. logic. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Does someone say something? Yeah, sorry about that. I like how linear she is. <laughs> yes, she has a very straightforward mind and she sticks to one thing at a time. But when you're at work, while let's say, you know, multitasking doesn't mean, you know, doing seven things at the same time. It just means using your time effectively. So let's say you've been asked to do one task and while you're waiting for that task to get done, why you're, you're got, you've got free time. I'll give you a very simple example. Let's say you've been asked to download a video that will take time or upload certain videos that will take some time. You've got a few minutes while those things upload. Now you can sit and stare at the screen while it's uploading, or you can start transcribing an email that your client has asked you to send out later. What are you doing in this case? You're utilizing your time better. All right. Why do you guys think step-by-step -step is important when it comes to paying attention or improving your attention to detail? What do you think this does? So that you don't miss any, any point or any step or any minor details. Yep, what else? I think the step-by-step -step approach lets you focus in a better way. Like it gives you, um, it helps you in prioritizing what's more important and taking it step by step. Yep. So brilliant answers. Here's what it does. And further you that you can uh, look at each step and decide how to improvise that. Exactly. When you've broken up your tasks into small steps, you can actually utilize your time better. Why? Because now you're focusing on one step at a time. You can pay more attention to it. And this frees up more time. When you're multitasking, when you're doing two things at once, guess what? You freed up more time. So now you can use that time to go back, look at, let's take the example of writing up an email while you were waiting for that video to download. Now, the time you had set aside to actually write that email, you can use to proofread it. What does this do? Improves your attention to detail. Maybe when you were typing in a hurry, you weren't able to see, but you made a typo or you missed out a crucial bit of information that you were supposed to add into it. Now you've got the time to go back, read it, how, see how it is, and then add that back in. Therefore, improving your attention to detail. All right, break large tasks into smaller ones. This is, again, going back to what we talked about. Your client has told you to do something huge. For example, somebody give me an example. Asma, give me an example of a large task that can be broken into smaller pieces and tell me how it can be done. Um, I'll say, you know, launching a campaign. You'll okay. have to do. Uh, you'll have to make avatars for your um, clientele, uh, your target audience. You'll have to make an ideal avatar, avatar and the avatar that's uh, existing, and then you'll have to um, come up with content, and you have to decide the mode of uh, communication. If you want it to over to be over text messages or emails, or you want it to be over a phone call, um, if you want this campaign to be a physical one or a virtual one. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. All yeah. So now how are you going to do that? What are you going to focus on first and foremost? And what are you going to focus on in the very end? How are you going to um, triage what's important? I think the first thing that, that, that I'll do will be researching my audience and uh, researching mm -hmm. about my audience, their interests and what they want and what medium suits them and what do they expect from me and what do they want, what need do they have that I can satisfy and then target that? Uh, so that research will be my first step and my priority. And uh, then I'll design the campaign. Okay, and, I'm uh, gonna pause you. And I yeah. want somebody else to tell me what should be what should be the thing that should come last. Okay. Ikra. Ikra, uh, are you I a marketing think, associate? 
uh, I'm account manager, but I have marketing background. So I think uh, the last would be how you're going to, uh, the content or, or the things, how you're going to actually advertise it or present it to the all the audience. That should come at the end and your campaign should come at the first because uh, deciding on what, when the campaign is starting, the uh, different casualties, for example, seasonality and such factors come beforehand and then you can decide on other factors. Awesome. All right, Lania, I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. I saw that you have your hand raised, go ahead. Uh, we can't hear you. I think your microphone might not Hello? be connected. Yeah, we can hear you yeah. now, go ahead. Uh, so I just want to add one thing that is, uh, you need to assemble all your tasks you have done previously, that all the small tasks you have done previously, and you should have the command on, on everything you have done. So by the end, you should have that much command that you can convince the other person uh, about your campaign or about the thing you have done, about the task you have done. Exactly. So that that's a part of the process, right? But it's really straightforward. First thing you need to do is figure out what's the most important part of your task or your project. And then you need to break it down into smaller pieces. Who's doing the research? When is this research going to be done? Who's creating the content? When is this content going to be created? Right down to the last bit, when is it going to be sent out to? Right? Who are we sending it out to? All of these things have to be done previously. But when it comes right down to it, Who's, where are we posting this? Where are we sending this content? Is it going through call? Is it going through email? So on and so forth. All of that comes at the end. All right, last bit on this particular slide was create and follow deadlines, which is pretty self-explanatory, right? Even when somebody does not give you a deadline. And a lot of the times the clients aren't gonna tell you straightforward, this needs to be done by 8 p.m. on a Saturday. No, they're going to tell you, huh, this is really important. We need to do it immediately. And when you're working with small business owner, like Jeff said, most of these guys are working in crisis mode. So they don't even have the time to think about what things should be done at what exact time. But it's very, very, very important to set those deadlines for yourself and then communicate them to your client. You know what this does? It gives you an advantage. Can someone tell me what that advantage might be? What's the advantage behind you? Look, you? You, look, you look smart. All right, there's one more. Jeff, you're in the you're right direction. You're one step ahead of, um, like, you're anticipating what's going to happen and you do it, like, beforehand. All right, good. Turns out there's and more than one advantage, but there's another one, and it's a really you, you big gain one. The trust. You gain the trust of the uh, client. True. What else? You get to choose. You get to choose your own deadline 90% of the time. You get to choose what work you get to focus on. If you go to your client telling them, hey, this is something that I'm going to do today. This is something I'm going to complete today. And these are the tasks I'm going to complete tomorrow. Guess what? You're giving yourself a reasonable deadline or you have the opportunity to give yourself a reasonable deadline. What happens when you give yourself a reasonable deadline? You don't get overwhelmed. Whereas, go ahead, Osama. Uh, you don't rush into things? Yes, exactly. And you can uh, better give attention to detail? Brilliant. See, this is what happens. If you create and follow your own deadlines, number one, you gain your client's trust. You look smart. Number three, you don't get overwhelmed because now you have the opportunity to choose how and when to do your work. And you know yourself better than anyone else. You know how much work you can effectively, efficiently, and properly complete in a day. And then you can choose what else you're getting done. So what is happening? You're telling your client, hey, I'm on top of things. I'm doing everything you want me to do, but here's the order in which I'm going to do it. But you're also letting them know that this is not going to be done today in a very smart, clever way. The other thing that I want everyone to think about, because Sabui hit it on the head, doing the things you need to do when you prefer to do them. And I, I you notice I left out the want, it's a, pref it's a preference thing. So you may be extremely good at crafting uh, a, 
an article or a sequence of emails or whatever the case is, first thing in the beginning of your shift that you're really good at doing it at that time. But if you push it four hours later in that shift, you're a little more tired and you're a whole lot less creative. So depending on in this example, I, if that was me, I would be doing all of my creative work early in, in my shift so that I could do the more rote and routine things in the second half of my shift when my brain's not quite as sharp as it was at the beginning of the shift. And, you know, be honest with yourself in an eight hour, nine hour period of time when you're working, you're not at a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the time. You know, we all ebb and flow. We all have things that we get excited about. Again, communicating with your client is critical, but let's step back and let's also teach our client how we work best. Now, you're not going to be able to do that maybe in the first 30 days, but as you feel like you're a member of their team, you're having great communication, you're turning things in on time, then mention the fact that, you know, in my example here, you know, I'm, I'm really good at writing creative kinds of things in the first four hours of the shift. In the second four hours, I tend to do project management tasking, you know, very routine types of tasks. And that, I know for myself as a business owner, I appreciate that because now I can start to think about how to give you work in the best format that's going to get the best result because remember i'm the winner if i ask you to do the things the way you prefer to do them i'm the loser if i force you to work in a style that's not your preference and too many people live in fear of having that kind of open conversation with their client thinking oh well, i'm going to get fired if i share this most people will i mean there's a there's always crazy people out there. You have to first understand that. So there are crazy people out there, but you know, I would be also presenting that to the client as what times of day do you work best? Where do we overlap? You know, for example, I'll give you an example today. So my executive assistant and I will be working on my email together today. So we have a time frame that we usually do this every day. That's good for us. But what we do is, so I open up my Outlook and I'm looking at everything that's in the inbox and I have three different inboxes. And so I'm working in one inbox. She's got her Outlook open on the other side. Think of it, she's on the other side of the wall, right? She's in Florida, 3,000 miles away from me, but she's working in another inbox. But what that does is for an hour and a half, we work together, but separately. But if she has a question, I can answer that question right away and she can just continue working to get my six or 700 emails that I'm behind right now. You know, so again, I'm using an exa a, a specific example of ways that you can find to work with your client that maybe you never thought of in the past. But the more you communicate and the more you ask questions of them, find those sweet spots, you know, where you're both at your highest peak of energy most excited you know some people are not morning people and never will be morning people and i know you guys have made a huge sacrifice to work at RevStack and work night shift so that's a huge sacrifice on your part but it's the same thing in that night shift time that you're working what's working best when are you down you know, I have people in the Philippines, Pakistan, and India that work for my recruiting company. And it's in my world, it's permissible for them to take a nap halfway through their night and then come back on and work. But that allows them to be bright and engaged versus the last four hours of their day just sitting around exhausted because it's the night shift. So again, good clients will work with you on these kinds of things but you have to tell them what's going on in your world i mean i didn't invent the nap thing 
my team asks for it. And I'm like, I don't care. Eat your dinner, you know, at whatever, two in the morning uh, in the Philippines and then rest for 45 minutes and then come back to work. And then we'll adjust your hours to make that all work. And all of a sudden I have a happier teammate, right? They're happier because they're getting a better quality of work done in a style that fits them. So remember, talk about style, talk about when you're the best at different components of your job and openly communicate with your client. I think that's the most important thing to do here. One other thing that I one other thing before we jump off of this, I want to make sure we talk about the other thing is if you're writing something, typically there's always like, if I write a, a, a complex email, I will save it as a draft for a couple of hours and come back to it and reread it before I hit send, because I'll always find mistakes spelling grammar tense you know all kinds of mistakes so in the days of old the way i would do that is i would print that piece of paper out and i would set it on the upper left hand side of my desk knowing that in a couple of hours i had to reread it edit it and then i would send it out so just the little trick about attention to detail the problem is if you just jam out that email and it's and i'm, I'm talking about a complex email here 500 words or more, and you hit send, and then how many of it has happened to you? You hit send, and then you find two spelling mistakes or two grammar mistakes, and you feel kind of like, man, I was an idiot. Never happened to anybody here? It's happened a bunch of times, but I have a hack for that. So if you guys are using Gmail, go into your settings, and you'll see that you can unsend that message for up to 10 seconds or 30 seconds which allows you the opportunity to pull that email back and fix the error that you saw in it. And guess what? Most of the times I catch my errors after I've hit send while I'm rereading the email that I've sent. I don't know why we do this, but I know a lot of people who do this. So that undo can save your life. Just a little tip. Kalani, yeah, so I think you had a question. Your mic is again, uh, completely. Sorry, I'm not. so sorry. Perfect. No yes. Yeah. Um, so the question is basically: there are times when you are setting up your task and uh, to do list and everything, but there are times when something more urgent comes and like, and you have to get that thing done in a half an hour, and that was not in your schedule. So uh, how to manage that with the importance of task you have already working on? Because it happens a lot with me and I, I get very much overwhelmed with so many things and then it, it, it gets very difficult to manage time. So it's really straightforward. The way I would handle that is ask the person or your client in this case, how urgent is this? I'm currently working on this task, which you asked me to complete previously. Do I need to leave this at the moment and work on this instead? Communication, that's it. And in that instance, your client's going to let you know what's more important. And then you're, you don't need to be overwhelmed. So basically other, what you're doing. Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. The other thing that you can do on your calendar, and again, this is a teaching your client, is you can do time blocking. And what I mean by that is you're going to say, for example, at the beginning, of, you know, 30 to 45 minutes into your shift, you're going to block the next hour and a half and your client knows this you've told them you've communicated where you're going to be working on a, a relatively urgent thing and on your calendar for the day you have two or three of these hour and a half time blocks again that your client knows about and they appreciate it because they know throughout this day you're going to get the top three things two or three things done that they need and then, so now remember, you're not reading your email, you're not reading your Slack, you're not reading any of this stuff. And it, everybody's, oh, well, the client won't like to wait. Well, trust me, if you're better at your job, they'll wait. You know, you're working for smart people, you know? And so block that time. I mean, I have time blocks every single day, hour here, hour there, 
So, you know, I've got this hour that I've blocked off. After this, I have an hour blocked off. You know, then I got two hours of just kind of working on email and stuff. So if I get disrupted, I can stop email and go work on a, a more urgent thing. And then I go back to a block of time. So think about time blocking. Um, so who's showing their screen here? That's me. Yeah, so right there, do not schedule work time to work. Because it's interesting, you know, Savui and, and I, I get this, a comment that most managers will make uh, or above is when do I get time to do my own work? You know, I'm in the meetings, I'm helping other people on my team out. I'm helping other people, you know, in your case, you're helping your client. Maybe you're helping somebody in rep stack because you have an expertise, you know, and things like that. So time blocking it, will help you it, out. So I'm going to jump into the next part of my training slides and sort of decided to give you a visual representation of how you guys can do this. This is literally my calendar for the week. And like Jeff said, every day I have an hour, at least half an hour blocked out on my calendar to just do my own tasks. Now, every day, here's the thing. In your job, you're going to have certain high intensity tasks and certain low energy tasks, right? For me, attending meetings is very high intensity because I have to constantly, you know, talk, lead, make decisions, so on and so forth. So if you notice, my calendar is color coded. All of the green and purple are my meetings that I have with people. And they're usually in the first half of my day because that's when I'm most energetic. That's when I can be at my best. Whereas other tasks, for example, documentation and emails and whatnot are towards the lower end of my day. I still have a day on Friday where I've blocked out most of my calendar so I can get a lot of work done. I don't take a lot of meetings on Fridays but I still have the decision. I can obviously do that. I can move my calendar around when I need to for urgent, important things, but I tend to put this and I've blocked this time off so nobody can schedule it without letting me know first. Now, another thing, if you notice, I've got a dinner break and I've got a coffee break, both for half hour. In your day, you get one hour. That's your total break. And most people tend to make the mistake of taking that entire one hour block and you know, taking that break and then coming back to work and working for four hours straight. I recommend not doing that. Instead, break your break into two pieces or even three pieces, 20 minutes each or 30 minutes each, whichever works for you and have a small break between both ends of your shift. One in the first half, one in the second half or three breaks of 20 minutes throughout your day. And let discuss this with your client on the very first day. Hey, this is how I would like to take my break so that I can be more efficient in my day. So interestingly, gonna... interestingly enough, as you explain this, Sabui, now I don't know mm -hmm. if this is a cultural thing, but in the United States, typically you get an hour for your dinner break or lunch break, whichever. Sometimes that's negotiated down to 30 minutes, but you also get in the United States two paid as a part of your day, 15 minute breaks. So you actually get an hour and a half throughout your shift to take your dinner and to, because it's been proven to Sabui's point, you, you got to break it up, you know, work an hour and a half, two hours, you need to stand up, you need to walk around. You're still probably thinking about the project that you're working on, but you got to get away. You got to have a cup of coffee or a Danish or whatever the heck is your thing. And so I'm just saying, I, I'm not sure what the rules are in Pakistan, but in the U.S., we actually incorporated those two 15-minute paid breaks. Right now, it's one hour of a paid break that includes your full nine-hour shift. So the way I've always advised my team, and I tell you guys, encourage you guys to do the same thing, is to break it up into smaller pieces that will work for you. Again, um, earlier, I used to take a 40-minute dinner break and a 20-minute coffee break towards the end of my shift. You guys can break it up whatever way you like, whatever way works for you best. But it's essential to break up your break and take it during your shift so that you feel energized. Like Jeff said, sometimes you need to just get up and stretch your legs. It's important, especially when you're working virtually. The next thing is notes. 
when you want to improve your attention to detail, taking notes is absolutely vital. They're your best friend because during the day, so many things are happening. So many tasks are being assigned to you. It's like rapid fires on Mondays. But what can really help is if in real time you're taking notes. Here, and, and I know it sounds really boring to really take out a pen and a paper and write stuff down if that doesn't work for you. And it doesn't work for me. If I write something down on pen and paper, I'm going to lose that paper and there go my notes. For some people, sticky notes are really helpful. What works for me is right here on my calendar. If I attend this meeting, I'm going to create a little task, call it agenda, and just write down the important things I need to remember from here. And you guys can see that I've done this in multiple places. And even in the future, for example, if in this meeting, I know that I need to talk about something, I'll make a little task here and write it down in my agenda. Another thing that works for a lot of people is if you don't wanna type it out, you feel like that's really annoying, you don't wanna write it down, send yourself a voice note. By the way, now Slack has the option, you can just send yourself a voice note. So quickly, 10 seconds, you send yourself a voice note. Remember to do this in this task. Remember to do this thing tomorrow. And that's it. Now you've sent yourself reminders. Those can act as your notes as well. So notes can be really helpful because when you're working on any specific task, you're going to forget certain aspects of it or certain details of it unless and until you have made a record of what needs to go into that task. And then when you're working on your task, it becomes so much easier when you have some sort of backup to return to and just cross check what needs to be done and what needs to be left out. What's your favorite method of taking notes, you guys? Pen and paper. Diary. Pen and, Pen and paper. Pen and paper, yeah. Pen and Pen paper. paper. Pen and paper. Yeah. Sticky yeah. notes work. I yeah, figured. But like I said, I wanted to give examples of what you guys could use in case nobody like pen and paper here. All right, I'm going to wrap it up because we're down to the fifth, last 15 minutes of this session. Somebody, when I started the call, a lot of you said that distractions are a huge problem when working remotely, and I agree with you. But here's how to minimize those. Distractions are going to happen. Even when you're in an office, guess what? Somebody behind you is having a really loud call with somebody else right? Not all of it. I used to work in a cubicle and trust me, it used to be so annoying because our support department used to be right behind us and they'd always be on calls. But here's what you need to do. You need to figure out how to minimize distraction, especially when you're working from home. Number one, have a dedicated workspace. Even if it's a small desk in the corner of your bedroom, just the act of getting up from your bed and going to that desk puts you in a different headspace. And it definitely improves your focus. Then ensuring that you draw that boundary with whoever you live with, because I know most of us live with our families. It's important to let them know that when you're at work, you're at work. They can't come and ask you to go and get nons or whatever that most of these guys are already familiar with. They need to know that you're at work and they, you cannot be disturbed during this time. And it can be difficult, you know, drawing that boundary with some people, but it's important. Sometimes it's as simple as, you know, putting on your headphones and pretending you're in a meeting just so that they know, oh, okay, this person's in a meeting right now. I can't bother this person. And why do we ask you guys to constantly keep your cameras on? Because naturally, and I can see some of you have your doors behind you. Somebody walks into your room. They're going to see you're on a camera, automatically feel uncomfortable and leave. What does this do? It makes them respect your boundary when, it, when you're at work. Then of course, the third point is pretty, pretty standard. It's pretty straightforward. Put your phone on silent. We get so many notifications, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, and they are so distracting. And when your phone is right there in front of you, lighting up, pinging constantly, it's normal to get distracted by it because that's how these apps were desi designed. They were designed to interrupt your focus and be addictive. But here's what you do. Put your phone on silent and put it face down on your table. I'm not even asking you to leave it in a different room. That's just too much. I don't even do that, so I'm not gonna ask you to do something I don't. But putting it down face down and on silent helps you not get distracted with all of these unnecessary notifications that you're constantly getting. I How also, many of you guys have your, sorry, I go ahead, also Josh. put in the chat, 
another option is what they call a white noise machine and you know i i gave you a couple of examples they're talking about it for sleep but you know it's going to be it's going to be that low i mean it's going to be that but it's always on and it kills a lot of the background noise around you so especially if you're cannot have a independent workspace and so people are moving in the background maybe you got a curtain behind you but it's not really a door and all of a sudden you can knock down some of that distracting noise so there's just an and example there as well the fun fact you guys can actually just go to youtube google white noise and put it into your headphones you don't even need to buy a machine and i read an interesting I don't even know where I read this and I don't know how accurate it is, but I heard that video game soundtracks are designed to build focus and it works for a lot of people to just have one of those, just that music in your ear while you're working on your task, obviously not in meetings, but if you're working on tasks and you need to really focus, you can even try that. Yeah, there's All a right. lot of, there, to back to your point on YouTube, if you Google music for focus, music to learn by, study by, do your work by. There are tons of types of music out there and there are a certain number of beats per second or minute. And, you know, it's all scientifically proven. So if you need something like that, you can do the same thing. There's also something known as uh, subliminal sounds. They also uh, they said to be improved focus. Awesome. So what I want you guys to do after this is done is go to your group channel and share all of these videos and music or whatever you feel like helps you focus best in your team channel and see if it helps somebody else out. That can be a little bit of a takeaway on, um, like you said, that subliminal thing or the white noise thing or the soundtrack that helps you focus. Share it with each other, which brings me to my last point. Ask for help. When you're working on huge projects, for example, someone here said I'm um, launching a campaign, that's a pretty big project for any organization. You cannot do it completely by yourself. You can be in charge of it, but you cannot be doing it completely by yourself. In that case, even though you can do most of the legwork and as associates, your clients are going to ask you to do most of the legwork, you can still ask for help. You just need to know what kind of help you should ask for. In your particular roles, I don't think delegation is going to be much of a thing, but if you've got an intern, teach them to help you work. However, you've got colleagues, ask them to help you in your task. Whenever you're assigned a particular task, do the legwork because that's important at this stage in your career. That's gonna, what's, that's gonna build your career for the future. Figure out what needs to be done, what's important, how to do it, your schedule, triage, get approval from your client. And then guess what? If you've got colleagues to work with, tell them, hey, this is how we're gonna be doing this. But I was, you know, maybe this is something that you could do while I focus on this thing and get approval for that from your client first. Is your client okay with you making sure that you're involving the whole team to work on a task once you've done all of the legwork? If yes, this is a great tool to help increase attention to detail because now you're not doing all of the stuff yourself. You've got somebody to help you out. Lastly, ask for feedback. Let's talk about that same project. You've done all the work, you've gotten it, you've pulled it together, or instead, let me give you an example. Let's say your client said, oh, I want you to draft an email and send it out to all of our clients as some sort of a welcome email or whatnot. And this is gonna be used forever. This is a pretty important email, right? Instead of writing it up and then sending it to everybody, here's what you should do. Write that email down, read it, make sure you've done the best you can, and then run it by somebody else before finalizing it. Most of the best person to do this is your direct line manager or your client. Send it to your client. Hey, this is what I've done. Just wanted to know your thoughts on it. I do this to this, to this day. What this does is give you a fresh perspective. Maybe after eight hours of working nonstop, you may have missed something and that's perfectly okay. But guess what? You're being proactive by sending it to your client. This is going to not only build trust, 
it's also going to let your client know that you've actually completed a task in a very subtle way and you've done it within the deadline you gave them. So you're sort of very subtly going to your client and saying, hey, guess what? I got all this work done in the deadline that I talked about. So now I can be trusted more. Visibility into the hard work you're putting in. And more than 90% of the time, your client's going to be, they're not going to nitpick. They're going to be grateful and appreciative of the work you've done. So this is a pretty clever way to get appreciation from your client too. All right. Jeff, any final notes? We're almost towards the end of the session. So some of you struggle with attention to detail. So that's fine. You have to do what I call build a crutch. And as Sabui just said, maybe that's sharing with a, a teammate or something else to proofread your work. Um, maybe that's, again, before I say something's completely done, I walk around the block three times and then reread it all. You know, it doesn't really matter what it is, but if you know you struggle with attention to detail, break your work up more, don't necessarily, and try to avoid uh, multitasking because multitasking is where most attention to detail falls apart because you're jumping between so many things, you're going to miss things. And just so you all know, multitasking is a myth. Just search on it, you'll find out. That's it. That's all I got. Awesome. We've got four minutes. Do you guys have any questions you want to ask? No? OK. Yes, I had to ask one question. Go ahead, Ritav. OK, uh, if we, you know, a task is taking too long to complete and uh, it's due to be you know, submitted that very same day and we are spending you know, extra hours. So do we need to come you know, commit, communicate it to our client or would it lower our credibility and we just keep on working and just deliver it to him without letting him know that it, does, it took us extra hours? No, this is absolutely not. This is how you handle that kind of situation. When you've been working really hard, but the task itself is just so big that you cannot absolutely complete it in the time you were assigned, here's what you do. You send your client the progress you've made on that task. Hey, this is what I've achieved and I'm consistently working on it hard to meet the deadline you've set for us. But I'm realizing that this will take more time than I currently have. So I want you, I wanted to know, do you want me to sit extra hours or come back tomorrow and start fresh and 90 percent of the time and i keep saying 90 percent because there's always going to be that 10 to 5 percent who's going to be like yeah sit and finish it now but 90 percent of the time your client's going to tell you oh great job on achieving this much thanks for letting me know you can start tomorrow or complete it tomorrow because that way again what you're doing is getting appreciation for working hard but in order to do that you need to have work and progress to back it up. If you've been sitting watching YouTube videos and not really paying attention to the work itself, then obviously that's not gonna fly. But if you actually have real progress and you have been struggling with the deadline, working hard, your client's gonna be understanding of it. The but you have thing, to absolutely other, notify them. Yeah, so you notify them. But the other thing that happens is if it's taking dramatically longer than your client expected, more than likely you're missing a piece of information. So by, let's say you're 50% done, you send it over to them, whatever method, Slack, email, whatever, and say, am I, you know, this is taking way longer than you expected. I'm working my, I'm working at it, but would you make sure I'm on the right track that maybe I'm missing something here? Cause it's amazing how many times, especially in the virtual world, they forget to tell you one thing. And that one thing is the critical component to get the work done in eight hours versus 18 hours. And if you don't know that, you know, here's a shortcut. Or when you get to this point, uh, have a quick 20 minute chat with me and I'll tell you where to go next. So uh, again, if there's nothing else we can't share here every single time is do not be afraid of your clients, communicate. You know, you, most people will get fired because they do not communicate, not because they over communicate. 100%. All right. So that brings us to the 